So to briefly review, uh, I began with looking at the, the Constitution in 1789. Of course, in language, a very important document in the history of human rights and the history of uni universal human rights. Uh, of course, the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Indeed, it is important, Constitution uh, making and the instantiation of law through a document is an important aspect of the fight for universal human rights, for universal human justice. However, have we seen, as we've seen, insofar as that remains merely at the level of language or the abstract level of disembodied law uh, and not coming into the world through various practices or continually, continuously uh, reinvigorated through our practices and through our demands that we live up to that law, then the law becomes abstract and empty. But nonetheless, it is important to write these things down, to, to instantiate them through constitutions, through words, uh, through, through, through the written word. In 1789, you also have the Rights of Man and Citizen, which was uh, an important document <clears throat> around the French Revolution that was a statement of universal human rights. And then in 1791, you have the Bill of Rights ratified, which as, as we saw, over ha half of them are all about uh, criminal justice and criminal process. The Fourth Amendment is about uh, searches and seizures, the Fifth Amendment about self-incrimination, uh, the sixth, uh, right to trial by jury. The seventh, the distinction between jury and judges' trials. And the Eighth Amendment about excessive bail and cruel and unusual punishment. So these, immediately after the Constitution was ratified, the realization that there needed to be some kind of uh, statement and instantiation in law, in basic universal rights of these these sets of, of, of rights that surround uh, criminal procedure. So that, that is an important and interesting point. And then from the 1790s uh, to the 1820s, you had what was called Jeffersonian democracy. As many of you know, we, that's one of those words we just kind of throw around, new democracy or, or kind of a democratic uh, procedure. Of course, there are different species of democracy in, in our country. Unfortunately, many people think that democracy simply is voting. And if you've done your, if you vote every four years in a presidential election, we have some of the worst turnout numbers um, in, in terms of uh, participation in elections, uh, maybe 60% at best during a presidential election year. But many people think that that is the, the minimal requirement to to participate in the the mechanizations of democracy there's you know participatory democracy deliberative democracy there's a lot of different important species of democracy but there's also history to it certainly in this country but in the 1790s and 1820s uh there was this uh the kind of prevalence of of jeffersonian democracy uh which was uh anti-aristocratic uh anti-cosmopolitan this is why our capital is in the uh, you know the kind of swampy uh, muggy regions of the Potomac in DC as opposed to a more cosmopolitan urban area like uh, New York so Jefferson kind of won that battle against Hamilton at that time and for for Jefferson it is it is very much about you know almost a Rousseauian idea of self-sufficiency uh, the idea of the the yeoman farmer or the isolated person who just kind of tended their own garden, to use a phrase from Voltaire, um, and so that perhaps was a movement away from the more aristocratic views of who ought have power, who ought 
um, legislate and who ought represent um, the, the people. So let's let's mark those as moments of enlightenment. Of course, these cast some some very dark and uh, problematic shadows. So if we go back before the Constitution in 1787, the infamous Three Fifths Compromise, which in order to ratify, to, in order to even get to the table to ratify the Constitution, uh, the uh, all of the the uh, the colonies and the the future states had to agree that a slave, an enslaved person, was three fifths of a person. That that's the kind of representation representation they would have uh, in terms of voting. So already you begin that with the violence against the wholeness of a group of people. So uh, that's 1787. Then immediately, right before the Bill of Rights, you know, one of the first laws was the Naturalization Law of 1790, which uh, demarcated who counted as a citizen. Of course, we know the history of this was also one that ex excluded women, um, and certainly, certainly persons of color were not even were were property, and not even persons, but. The Naturalization Law of 1790 excluded Native Americans, uh, indentured service servants, uh, free, uh, freed enslaved persons. So even if you were free, you you couldn't be a citizen. Uh, of course, enslaved persons and uh, Asians. So that's the Naturalization Law of 1790, one of the first acts of legislation. So. It, the structure of the way that that law works is this inclusion and exclusion and oftentimes defining those boundaries of membership and other so whether it's and we we'll, we may discuss these these kind of conceptual categories of citizen criminal enemy uh monster and alien because it's important in in the rhetorical discourse uh, and someone like Carl Schmitt's theory of politics, um, which many of us would read and be abhorred by, but it also is a realistic snapshot of the way that power often structures the function of politics to define a friend and enemy, to define us and other. And when it comes to criminal, enemy, alien, and monster, a lot of times those terms get conflated. And criminals, even though they are citizens, and by the very fact that they are citizens, that's why our law has a hold over them. That's why our law has the right or the justification to to punish, uh, are treated as wholly other, as treated as enemies, as treated as monsters, or treated as aliens, which stand outside of the law. So there's this this tension, if not outright contradiction, in the way that, that we use these terms and conflate these terms in our, our political discourse. So the naturalization law of 1790, immediately defining these, these categories of exclusion. And then, of course, the problematic figure of Jefferson, uh, who wrote the Declaration of, of Independence, uh, that was a, an important statement in uh, that you know all men are created equal but of course inside of that it excluded certainly the the savages right that word is in there uh the the native americans that we more or less completely uh annihilated uh in 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 the, the founding of this country um jefferson also owned 52 slaves uh and of course most famously uh his relationship with sally, sally hemmings and then in 1778, there's an interesting document that will be included on the Canvas page that he wrote um, a bill for proportioning crimes and punish punishments. So you can see some of his uh, thoughts about how we ought punish, uh, some, uh, some of which are very harsh, that involve execution for theft. Uh, some that look to us very draconian and backward looking and hardly ideas of the Enlightenment. 